Please welcome our uh, guest speaker today, Dr. Mark Rosten. Mark is a research fellow at the Staler Taylor Center uh, for uh, Energy Policy and Finance. Uh, his research focuses on um, climate risk and investment portfolio management. And he has 20 plus years of pre professional experience in the asset management industry. So I am very excited to hear his talk today, uh, which is on the cost of the hedging climate risks. Uh, without further ado, uh, Mark, please take the stage. Great, thanks So Young. Um, I'm uh, very excited to be giving this talk. Um, the, the title, um, how much does it cost to hedge climate risk? I guess what you should think about is um, this is basically a bait and switch, which for those of you who are thinking about going into the asset management business, you should get used to that. Um, you know, you need to learn this early that asset managers promise things that they don't deliver on. Um, more seriously, when I first began to investigate sustainable investing, I, I was struck by the performance focus. And, and I was motivated, my, the motivation for what I'm working on is a question that, that, that came up to me was, was should sustainable investing, in investing outperform? To a large degree, asset managers seek to convince asset owners that doing, you know, doing good means they will do better in their investment portfolios, but it's not completely clear that, um, that that's true. We would like investors and managers who do good for, to have greater success. And we'd like those who choose to continue to uh, harm, do harm, to do poorly. However, that, that's, not really, that, that's not really true and it's, it's probably wrong. Um, you know, we can hope it's true, but basically if you start from the first premise and you say, okay, you know, green buyers are gonna bid up prices on green companies, and bidding up prices today reduces future returns. Similarly, if green investors choose to sell their dirty assets, they push down prices. And the, the result is that they raise prospective returns. Um, that's, that's reasonably easy to see, but in fact, it gets somewhat more complicated. Some of you may be familiar with the concept of integrated assessment models. Um, what these models attempt to do is, is work out the core dynamics of decision-making, investment, and climate feedback loops in a, in a, in a fully developed economic system. Um, we know these models aren't true, but we, we still try to produce them anyway. And the, the fact is, depending on how you lay out the dynamics of these models, you can end up with um, economies where you know, more climate friendly investments perform better or perform worse. It's just sort of a, a construct of the model. And we can't really um, necessarily test these models particularly well. Um, the other concern I had going into this research exercise is that traditional performance driven sustainable, uh, traditional performance to drive sustainable investing may actually fail. Like most investment strategies have periods when they do well and when they do poorly. And it seems to me it's not particularly helpful if we encourage people to make sustainable investments simply as a, you know, don't worry, this is going to outperform exercise. So what I'm trying to do is refocus the story on that uh, the idea that sustainable investing should succeed as a risk management tool, even if it doesn't necessarily succeed in um, short run performance. So let's, let's turn back to our core question, how much does it cost to hedge climate risk? Well, we have to answer three questions to, to work our way to an answer to this question. The first one is, what does climate risk mean in this context? Um, I think we all have views as to what climate risk is, but I wanna narrow this into some particular examples and we'll, 
We'll talk about that in a bit more detail. I want to understand, I want to make sure everyone understands what we mean by hedging when we're talking about hedging climate risk. And finally, we're going to walk through what to many of you um, who you know, know a reasonable amount of finance might be just a little bit of an extension of how you think about uh, portfolio construction, but this is going to help inform a discussion about how to think about the costs of what's going on in these attempts to uh, hedge climate risk. So what do we mean, what do we mean by uh, climate risk? Well, Taking it very simply, greenhouse gas emissions raise temperatures, increasing the risk to economy. Well, what risks increase? There are many different views here. Um, weather changes cause damages to agriculture, rising sea levels lead to flooding. These are all sort of direct physical risks. Um, there are transition risks around climate change that you may be aware of. Um, as you know, the economy realigns in different ways. Uh, I think some of these transition risks are much more applicable to what we're talking about in um, uh, investment and capital markets discussions. But from a in the in the simplest sense, economists will tell you, um, you know, taxing emissions solves everything. Um, it's simple. It's straightforward. Um, the story is about externalities. When we, when we burn fossil fuels, we create greenhouse gases and greenhouse gases get, you know, harm the, the, the aggregate economy and the aggregate world, society, however you want to look at this. And it, there's no cost to the emitters. If we could tax, um, we could have solved that problem long ago. But basically, you know, the view today is either it's politically impossible or it's too late. It's really not going to matter. That's not a feasible way to uh, to solve these climate risks. In in many regards, we're left with um, uh, what people can refer to as the nth best solution. Um, basically, we're using policy and you know, societal pressures of various sorts to raise, raise the implicit price of greenhouse gases. The idea is if we can, you know, push up the um, explicit and, uh, and implicit prices of greenhouse gases, we can shift in the direction of solving climate change. But you could, you could easily see that this adds risk to the system because all of a sudden we're dealing with um, policy risks, um, how um, investor sentiment can shift and impact um, the costs to different companies of you know, working, working these costs through the system in this um, indirect way, rather than specifically through, you know, for example, carbon taxes. Um, as, a, as a proxy for this risk, we have to come up with some measure of you know, what's driving around this risk or what matters to different companies. You may have heard the term scope one and scope two emissions. Uh, scope one emissions are the uh, direct greenhouse gas emissions or carbon emissions from um, a company's operations. Scope two have to do with their um, purchase of, of energy inputs, of electricity inputs into their production. Um, Basically, and, and parenthetically, there's also scope three, which is the carbon emissions in their um, supply chains. But for, for our purposes, we're going to focus on, on scope one and scope two emissions. And we're, I, I, I guess I'm, for convenience, labeling this carbon intensity. Um, this is um, carbon dioxide tons of carbon dioxide per million dollars in sales for a company. Um, this conveniently sort of normalizes to the idea, you know, we need something to normalize based on, um, you know, how big the company is. We can't necessarily use equity markets because it doesn't account for a capital structure correctly. Um, just think of this as, 
as just a, a simple and a reasonably simple and straightforward measure of what is the carbon involved in a um, the the carbon involved in a particular risk facing uh, a company for climate. So you know if I am a if I need to produce a lot of CO2 uh, per million dollars of sales, then I have much higher risk to a implicit or explicit jump in the price of carbon than you know another company in another business that doesn't actually you know produce material greenhouse gases uh, from their um, uh, production processes. As I said, this is just one example of a proxy for risk. Later on, uh, you know, we're going to walk through some reasonable detail using carbon intensity, but at, at the end, I'll, I'll make some comments about, about other types of risks uh, that we could use instead of just carbon intensity. So the, the next question um, is, what do we mean by hedging? Um, hedging in its, in its sort of simplest form means offsetting some potential losses with opposite positions. So hedging often means giving up substantial potential gains to isolate some sort of risk. I also may amplify particular risks or uncertainties simply through my hedging exercise. So as an example, suppose I think Toyota will perform very well in the auto industry. I think the economy is strong, but I'm also concerned that the economy may turn. If I simply bought Toyota stock, I may be confident it will do well in a strong economy, and I may be confident that Toyota will outperform GM. Um, so I could choose to say, well, I'm going to hedge my Toyota position by shorting GM. What I've done then is I've hedged my auto industry risk. I've probably hedged much of my sort of macroeconomic environment risk, and I've amplified my view that Toyota is going to outperform its peers because I've specifically said, you know, Toyota is going to outperform GM. But what I've also done is I give up, I, I, I've given up this tailwind of a strong economy where I just benefit, you know, when a rising tide lifts, lifts all boats. Hedging small risks and risks that are uncorrelated with bad states in the world are really cheap. So let me try to pick an example that should be near and dear to some of your hearts at least. Um, a Stanford student's renter's insurance. That's simply you hedging your risk of loss. You're not hedging a bad state in the world except for possibly you and your family who think that's a really bad state in the world. Um, you don't really have much stuff to lose. Your risk of a, you know, a break-in isn't particularly correlated with the aggregate, aggregate risk to the economy or the aggregate risks to an insurance company. So buying renter's insurance when you're a college student is really cheap. Um, similarly, um, Hedging, hedging the public equity exposure for small portfolios is not particularly expensive, even though that requires hedging a bad state of the world. Like hedging an equity portfolio means I want something that's going to pay off and um, in the event that the equity market drops significantly. It's a correlated hedge, but if you have a small portfolio, you can, you can do that just fine. Things get different when we're dealing with large risks that are correlated with bad states hedging can become expensive and or prohibitive. Here, you know, imagine uh, CalPERS, the largest pension plan in the, in, in the United States, has about a $230 billion public equity portfolio. Um, if CalPERS wanted to hedge their portfolio for, you know, I don't know, pick a number, a 25, 30%, 50% drop in the equity market, um, that's just not going to happen. That's not a hedgeable risk. Um, they can manage the risk on the margins, but they can't really do it. So to a large degree, what we're talking about with hedging and climate change is managing risk and, manage, and, and smoothing a transition. There's nothing we can really do with an investment portfolio um, in, in you know, public markets that's you know, going to solve climate change. Um, but We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in some of the concluding remarks as well, because I think there are ways where we can we can sort of push in the right direction and help. 
So what does it cost? The answer is it's really complicated. What I'm gonna do in the next uh, several minutes is try to teach you everything you need to know about finance and try to apply it to climate change. We're gonna start with a crash course on modern portfolio theory to provide a, a, a foundation for investment decision-making. We're gonna extend modern portfolio theory to the way um, quantitative portfolio managers or investors um, evaluate managers and think about benchmarks and risk-taking. And then we're gonna to try to extend this to some particular uh, applications within climate that'll hopefully make some sense to you. So uh, here goes all of modern portfo portfolio theory. I'm trying to do this for an audience that um, has some basic understanding of economics and not a whole lot of understanding of finance. So um, for those experts in finance, I, I hope I don't screw this up so badly that you think I misled anyone. If we start with Modern portfolio theory looks at um, excess returns, I'm sorry, looks at expected returns and risks of assets. So if you just think of assets as being described as um, expected returns, expected risk, and the covariances of all the assets with all the other different assets. So you sort of plot here, any random number of assets. And in, in fact, this should be all of the assets in the world would fit on this plot. And we would have to calculate all of the correlations and covari the covariances between all of the different assets. And we can construct any number of portfolios using all of those different assets. If we could construct a particular set of portfolios, we get a thing that's called the mean variance frontier. The mean variance frontier is saying that for any given um, amount of risk, I am constructing the portfolio that has the highest expected return for that amount of risk. An important thing to understand about the mean variance frontier is that it doesn't depend on investor preferences. This curve plots out based entirely on the um, characteristics of the underlying assets. If you remember from your introductory economics classes, something called indifference curves. Indifference curves describe how an in, how a, a individual um, makes economic decisions. So in your economics class, you probably looked at indifference curves between work and leisure or a classic example of, you know, guns and butter, two things, you know, over which investors have preferences. This is the exact same situation. Investors like expected return and they dislike risk. So for small amounts of risk, they don't need very much extra return. And that's why you know, the curve is reasonably flat over here because at very small amounts of risk, um, they don't need to pick up a lot of return. As we get to more and more risk, investors demand more and more return. And so what an investor is doing is saying, well, I'd really like to maximize my utility, which means moving this direction in indifferent, with indifference curves and they're basically saying, I want to, I want to maximize my utility um, when I'm hitting the mean variance frontier, which means you get to this point that's a tangent. Um, hopefully that made some sense. The, the next thing that happens in modern portfolio theory is you need a risk-free interest rate. We use a risk-free interest rate because we basically nice and conveniently assume everyone borrows and lends at the same rate. And it's nice that it lines up at zero. We could, there are lots of more theoretical reasons why a risk-free interest rate applies here, but let's just make that simple assumption. Then what we do is we say, well, if we draw a tangent line from the risk-free interest rate to the mean variance frontier, we plot a sing, we, we hit a single point that single point is the optimal portfolio that the, everyone in the market should hold given where interest rates are. Um, why is that the optimal portfolio? Because if everyone can borrow and lend at the, the risk-free interest rate, then they can actually 
move themselves into higher utility space by a combination of the market portfolio and the risk-free rate. So if you'll notice my investor magically, the second indifference curve, which is a higher level of utility, is now tangent to the line that connects the risk-free rate and the market portfolio. And every single investor will hold a portfolio on this line. The investors up here will be borrowing money. The investors down here will be lending money at the risk-free rate. So this describes how all decisions are getting made in, um, uh, you know, in the concept, in, in the framework of modern portfolio theory. You may have heard the term sharp ratio. The sharp ratio is really the slope of this line. It tells you, you know, what is the, um, uh, the trade-off that the market portfolio has between um, uh, risk and return. On the next slide, we're going to switch gears a bit and talk about what quantitative portfolio managers do and how managers evaluate risk. Um, a particular asset manager or portfolio manager has private information that differs from the market. This private information can be about, is generally about the characteristics of the assets. So they could have a private view about, uh, about correlations. They get a private view about expected returns and expected risks. And what will happen is they will use this private information to construct a, a frontier of possible outcomes that are using that information that map to um, excess returns and tracking error. So if you think about what's going on in this picture, down here in the corner where you have zero excess return and zero tracking error, imagine this is just an index portfolio. So this is a benchmark portfolio like the S&P 500 or later we'll see, I, I happen to use an MSCI index. This, the, when the manager uses this conditioning information they have, this private information, it allows them to say, I'm going to generate excess return and generate some expected risk. And I will, you know, plot where my portfolio is going to land. So here I just use an example of someone who's using some sort of conditioning information to say, I can generate some excess return with some volatility or tracking error around a benchmark. And that's going to give me a portfolio that someone wants to hold, that my investor wants to hold, with what's called an information ratio. That's this trade-off between excess return and tracking error. Now, generally, in the, in the asset management world, a product strategy has a particular um, uh, a, a manager has a particular information ratio out of their, um, their proprietary information, or they can have a product strategy. So for example, you could have three different products that, a man, that, a, that an asset manager runs that sort of target tracking errors that they think investors might want to want to invest in. So for example, at one of my old firms, um, we managed three different products in long only US equities. And we happen to have, you know, similar but slightly different information ratios for three different tracking error portfolios, much like you, you see here. How do we apply this to climate risks? So Instead of having excess return on the vertical axis, I'm putting something that I'm calling a sustainability metric. This could be a lot of things, but what we're going to put on this axis is this measure of um, uh, carbon intensity. And we're going to use carbon intensity as a percentage of, um, of a decreasing, sorry, I don't, want to, I don't want to confuse you or me, a decreasing percentage of the benchmark. So if you think about what I'm going to do is I'm going to say down here is the benchmark. This, this is the point where you have 
all of the carbon intensity of the benchmark. And by going up the vertical axis, I'm decreasing the carbon intensity of the benchmark by modifying the portfolio. So I'm reducing the carbon exposure by changing the allocation of the portfolio by adding more of some stocks, less of some other stocks. And that's causing tracking error in the portfolio to go up but it's also reducing the carbon intensity. And this will play out this uh, sustainability frontier, much like a uh, excess return and tracking error frontier. And in a similar way, um, you can, investors will have indifference curves that will um, plot or describe how they would choose to trade off uh, sustainability metrics, so their desire to decrease their carbon intensity at the same time they are willing to take on tracking error risk. Um, there's a couple of different ways to think about what's going on with these indifference curves. Um, for example, um, investors could simply say, "I don't like I don't like carbon in my portfolio," so. It's just by saying, I'm putting this sustainability measure into my utility function. Um, economists don't like this. Economists don't like putting weird things into utility functions because you can generate any outcome you, you'd like by, by simply modifying your utility function. More generally, they prefer to think about things that are risks. So for example, rather than saying, I just don't want to own fossil fuel extractors, economists would prefer things like coal companies will be regulated out of business or oil reserves will be stranded and companies aren't valuing them correctly because those assets are going to be stranded. Um, or, you know, climate change, a more dramatic version of this is climate change will cause some tipping point. And when that tipping point happens, you know, whole industries are going to disappear, the economy is going to realign itself, etc. So what, what we want to think about is what's the nature of a risk that is driving these decisions, driving an investor's decision to say, I want to reduce my carbon intensity. In this setting, what I want to distinguish, because this is going to help us think about what's the cost to hedging. In this scenario, we're talking about trading off something that's pretty, pretty well known. We are definitively reducing the carbon intensity of the portfolio in exchange for tracking error versus the um, hiring an, an active investment manager who's saying, I'm going to try to add excess return, and I know I'm going to add tracking error. And so when we're, you know, the, the difference here is information ratios in um, with, with asset managers adding expected return is about trying to do something. Whereas with these sustainability measures, we sort of, we know it's going to happen. Um, so let's, uh, go to the real world. I'm just jumping ahead to get to the real examples. So let's play where like we're quant portfolio managers. What you're looking at here is a real actual curve generated. Um, so if as, as you see on the vertical axis, as I mentioned before, you're seeing decreasing carbon intensity. So we start in this plot at about 70% of the carbon intensity of the benchmark. Um, this is using the MSCI USA index at the year end 2015. The benchmark itself is generating 134 tons of carbon per million dollars in sales out of 621 positions. What you'll notice is we can decrease carbon, carbon intensity very quickly with not very much tracking error. We get to a 50% carbon intensity with about 17 basis points of tracking error. You should understand that in the institutional world, even in the institutional world, 17 basis points of tracking error is not very much at all. Uh, to give you some context, like, you know, active, typical active mutual funds could have, you know, three, five, seven percent 
sorts of tracking error, and we're talking small fractions of that. When we reduce the carbon intensity uh, to uh, by 90%, we're still only at about 1.1% tracking error, and there are still 263 positions in this portfolio. So one of the things you want to understand is what's happening when we reduce this carbon. We are taking um, we're, we're taking very small bets that are deviating from the benchmark. So the way this this process works is uh, it's in the footnote. I'm sure you can't read it, um, but it, we're we're basically using a um, a model uh, called Barra. Barra is a commercial risk model that does very sophisticated optimization of portfolios to try to minimize the tracking error around a benchmark. So this is it's not like what we're doing is excluding fossil fuel extracting companies or excluding utility companies. We are underweighting them in very particular ways to um, attempt to make this tracking error as non-systematic as we can. This tracking error is actually highly idiosyncratic. It's not driven by anything that you would you would sort of assume would drive this tracking error. So it's not like we're just you know not holding utilities and we're dumping all the you know the money into you know tech stocks and healthcare stocks because they don't generate any CO2. Um, it's pretty carefully constructed to minimize those kinds of risks. Um, and so with that framework in mind, understanding that we can take not particularly uh, large risks and actually reduce the carbon dramatically, we want to take our next step, which is let's think like a risk manager or a hedge fund manager. And let's construct a hedged portfolio. What are we going to do? We're going to buy the 30% carbon intensity portfolio. So we're buying a portfolio that is very underweight carbon intensity relative to the benchmark. And we're going to sell short. I had to put it down here you know, below the axis because my scale wasn't quite right. But we wanna, we're going to sell short the benchmark. So when we go long this 30% portfolio and we sell short the benchmark, what we're really doing is we're constructing a very low volatility portfolio. So it has no equity market exposure. We've hedged out all of our equity market risk. It's a pretty darn liquid portfolio because the thing we're shorting is just a very uh, easy to short, widely traded uh, benchmark. We're long a whole lot of highly diversified positions. And the performance of this long short portfolio will now reflect the risk of something that is very, very short carbon intensity. So um, what we can then think about is the performance of this long short trade will be that of the risk of, of, of uh, to the economy of carbon intensity. So that's a little bit hard to understand, I'm sure. I'm sure you all have some questions. But the basic idea is imagine the price of carbon for political reasons or social reasons all of a sudden jumped. And everything that was um, producing lots and lots of carbon emissions, um, those stocks would be hurt. Um, more significantly than others. And so under those situ in that situation, this portfolio would likely perform quite well because it's heavily short the carbon intensive uh, companies and it's long this portfolio that, that hedges most of the equity market risk and leaves this residual risk that is just about, carbons, about, about the carbon risk. Um, I make uh, this note at the end here where I say, this is an options replication strategy for, for those of you who, you know, 
may know more about this, depending on the underlying model that's driving around the carbon risk, whether it's a continuous risk or a discontinuous risk, you could think about this long short strategy as replicating an option on being short carbon intensity. Um, I'm hoping this made some sense for you, but let me, let's talk about some conclusions and implications for um, in, investors. Um, the, the first one that I think is worth thinking about is we can, the, the traditional benchmarks we use like the S&P 500, or in my case, in this case, the MSCI USA index, they're, they're just convenient, easy, and cheap. There's nothing magical about them. And one of the things we, we see here is we can take the carbon exposure down, the carbon intensity exposures down extraordinarily without really putting that much risk into, you know, risk of deviating from these benchmarks. So I think it's worth asking the question for institutions, you know, do you really need to use these traditional benchmarks or, you know, can you sort of eat the risk of these, these slight deviations. And there's something particularly um, uh, relevant from you know, you know, sort of traditional economics here is when investors get more and more wealthy, like big institutions you could think of as you know, just extraordinarily wealthy investors, they become uh, closer and closer risk neutral. And what that means is they don't even care about these tiny little uncorrelated non-systematic risks. So I think it's worth thinking you know, for big institutions to say, well, maybe I should just use a different set of benchmarks and I should forget about using these benchmarks that are so reliant on uh, carbon intensity. The second thought around institutional investors is how do you actually implement some of these ideas? Um, you, you know, we used a very simple example of carbon intensity, but in fact, you could do this in a more sophisticated way and almost say, well, I want to trade off um, carbon, I want to trade off coal versus natural gas. Because you know, we know during a transition period that natural gas is less carbon intensive than coal for producing electricity. So you could do a similar exercise that sort of trades off you know, different parts of the uh, energy complex. Uh, the third point, which I, I think is, is particularly useful, is because this strategy is highly scalable and not particularly risky relative to equity markets, um, you can use this long short hedging strategy to hedge away from your public equity portfolio. So for example, you know, I did a bunch of work for a very large insurance company several years ago that has an enormous incumbent portfolio, uh, private equity portfolio in um, uh, extraction industries. And someone in that position could say, well, I can't really get out of the risk of my private equity portfolio, but I could in fact use a larger hedging tool out of my public equity portfolio to hedge the carbon risk and transition risk of my private equity portfolio. Um, for just in, in a couple of concluding thoughts for, for individuals, um, I think it's worth thinking about your own preferences and the trade-off you make in your own decision-making. Like I will admit traditionally or I'm, traditionally in the past, I've sort of been um, call it semi opposed to investing this way. You know, I generally used to take the view that um, better to invest and generate the best returns I could, and then choose to say, I'm going to take the extra money I make and use it to do good things. Uh, but, but frankly, looking closely and examining these uh, ideas has convinced me that, first of all, it's not particularly costly to um, think about directing a portfolio in a more sustainable way. And second of all, if I sort of embrace this idea that I'm actually managing risk, uh, 
by shifting the portfolio. And I think I, I, I feel much more comfortable saying, all right, there's a good reason that is good for my portfolio in the long run, even if it means I, I possibly give up a little bit of return in the short run. But most importantly, I, I think this you know, drives people in the, in the direction of saying, I want to um, invest in a sustainable way that will manage my risk rather than simply doing this to try to generate um, you know, greater returns because some asset manager is convincing me that if I, you know, follow their recipe for sustainable investing, I'm going to definitively generate, you know, better returns. Um, I hope, I hope people could follow that reasonably well. Um, so young, I will uh, open it up to questions and hopefully I don't have to start over to re-explain everything because I made no sense. Well, thanks, Mark. I mean, it's really insightful. And I I have a couple of questions and also we got a question from the audience too. So um, I think uh, we are kind of heading there together. So, um, okay. and then please, you know, raise hands, anyone, if you have any questions. So um, my one question is more about the clarification question. So if you go back to that um, sustainability ratio um, graph, how can you actually implement this long short portfolio? Like for example, um, you know, like uh, how can you create those portfolio that has 70% of carbon intensity reductions versus, you know, like 0% or, so. I mean, 0% sure. is benchmark, but um, you know, how can you um, make those a portfolio to-, sure. to long? Yeah. So, so the, the, the simple answer is uh, you need an optimizer. And a risk model. Um, so what, what is going on in that portfolio construction is, you know, in a normal portfolio optimization exercise, you're saying, I want to, I want to um, maximize my expected return subject to a bunch of different constraints um, of any sort um, using the, um, the, the benchmark uh, and the uh, risk model. And so what I've, what I did in that plot, I'm not sure how quickly I can go and share the picture again and try to re-explain it. Let's see. All we're really doing is saying, I want to, I want to make a minimum tracking error portfolio that is constraining the carbon intensity of the portfolio. And so every, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the optimization uh, software, I have carbon intensity for every single company that's in the, in the index. And, you know, I know that the index, the cap weighted index has a carbon intensity of about 134 tons uh, per million dollars in sales. And I basically, you know, I, I, I sort of pick a number and I say, okay, give me a portfolio that has a 10% carbon intensity. So give me a 13 ton portfolio and construct the lowest tracking error 13 ton portfolio I can. That'll give me a, you know, that gives me a, um, you know, th that, that'll give me a um, portfolio that I need to trade. And I would, you know, call up my local, uh, I, I, I'd say call my local broker, but really no, this would be, I'd call my local, um, you know, swaps market dealer. And I'd say, I want to, you know, I want to swap that's, you know, long this basket of stocks and it's short this index. And, you know, I want X number of dollars of notional exposure. You know, this is not something that, you know, I can do personally or, you know, many of you can do personally. Um, but these are portfolio, this is, you know, these are strategies that big institutional investors can do all the time. Is that does that help you understand? Does that make sense for you know how someone actually goes about doing this? So basically, all I'm doing is saying, well, I've I want to you know I want to sell these 600 stocks at these 
you know, in these uh, quantities, and I want to buy these 300 stocks in these other quantities, and it's going to be a portfolio that doesn't have any net equity exposure. And so that what amount the exposure that remains is um, this thing that we can just describe as um, the risk of carbon. It's, 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 a, it's, a little, it's a little abstract, but that's, that's sort of the idea of what's going on. So if I say, all right, fine, I, you know, if I have a $100 billion, uh, uh, that's probably too big to worry about. If I have a several billion dollar equity portfolio and I say, well, I'd really like to you know, take all the, I, I'd like to take all the carbon out of my equity portfolio, um, I could do this by not holding any fossil, you know, utilities or fossil fuel extractors, or I could do it this way, which is a much more, you know, precisely tuned approach and doesn't necessarily have the big uh, sector bets and sector risks. But on the other hand, it, it all, it's also not like, it's not divesting my portfolio of fossil fuels. Um, or I, as I was alluding to, if I have a, you know, a, a several billion dollar public equity portfolio, and let's suppose I also have another billion dollars of private equity, and a whole lot of my private equity just because of, for historical reasons, happens to be tied up in reasonably carbon intensive uh, industries, I can just size up, I could just size up this, this long short trade to say, okay, you know, take the take the carbon out of my public equity portfolio and take the carbon out of my private equity portfolio um, because I can. Um, or maybe, you know, maybe an institution engages in this sort of activity because, you know, I, it, you know, we, so young, as you know, we, we've had discussions within our research team, you know, do, should the pension plan assets of a company count in some regard into their, you know, scope three emissions, or, you know, when Stanford is going through an exercise of calculating Stanford's, um, you know, carbon footprint, well, does, does the endowment count? Um, you know, these are, these are all interesting questions that, you know, the uh, different investors will have different views about, you know, which, which of these exposures should count and, you know, how we should deal with them. Yeah, in that way, uh, I mean, I have questions about the proxies too, but uh, let me ask you questions on behalf of our audience. Um, I think uh, you've answered some of the questions already, <laughs> but um, my question also about questions that um, have you uh, tracked as the returns um, of those changing long short portfolio. Um, and then, um, you know, how's market is pricing this already or not yet? Um, and then how stable this optimal long short portfolio is? Okay. So um, the, the performance of this portfolio. So let me, let me talk about performance a bit. There are lots of people who are looking at the question of how how does you know how does sustainable investing perform, and you know that was one of the my my I'll call it initial frustrations because it it depends it depends on a lot of things it depends on exactly how you implement it it depends on the data you use to measure sustainability it depends on the time period and that's what brought me to the question of well wait a second instead of asking the question you know has it has it worked i wanted to ask the question should it work and you know, and I and my my tendency is to say I'm not really sure why it should work in the long term. I can understand, you know, if we if we're bidding up the prices of green assets, that's almost like a sort of a momentumy kind of trade. Um, but it's not clear to me that that means anything for the long term. And then, if you um, this might get a little bit complicated if I haven't already done that. But if you think about this long short trade as a, as a replication of an option on a jump in the price of carbon, 
which mathematically speaking, like in a, in a theoretical sense of how you um, reproduce, uh, how you hedge option price uh, options for option pricing purposes, this is legitimately um, an option strategy. Um, you could, you then can infer that the movement of the expectation of the carbon price is actually changing the option price. So if you you know know anything about options pricing, we understand an options price has to do with you know what's the price of the underlying, what's the strike price of the option, how long is it until the option expires, and what's the volatility on on the underlying. And I think we could probably, in some sense, figure out what's been going on in the performance of sustainable investing if we sort of knew the true underlying model of the carbon price and the implicit option. So it's like if the option strike price is moving around because of how you've constructed the portfolio and the time to expiration on the option is really, it's actually an uncertain thing in this context because we don't know when the policy proposal might come through or we don't know when the tipping point hits that causes some you know, massive shift in the economy. It's very hard to predict how, what the, you know, the profit and loss on this strategy ought to be because it's, const it's constructing a PL that reflects this very odd option structure. And so that's where I, I just find it more satisfying to say, well, I'm thinking about this risk and I know I'm reproducing this risk um, in, a, in a portfolio. And it, you know, maybe it's a little blind faithy, um, but I think it needs to be. Um, another way, I just, I guess, another way to approach this is like the World Wildlife Fund, you know, sort of went through this uh, reasonably complicated transaction to say we just want to basically sell all of our fossil fuel assets. They divested, they did it through a swap, and it worked really well. It's very straightforward, um, but it, it, it's, it's not necessarily like hedging the risk going forward to what happens to the total economy or to all of capital markets. There are some people who have developed way more complicated strategies to try to hedge this risk, like using um, uh, natural language processing of news stories to construct synthetic portfolios that respond uh, to news stories. And I, I, I'm trying to view this as like, okay, World Wildlife Fund, really simple over here, straightforward, everyone understands how it works, but it's not ideal. You know, you've got some of this very theoretical, um, uh, not intuitive at all of what's going on. And I was trying to sort of split the baby and say, I'm going to, you know, sit in the middle here and say, well, I can construct you know, a long portfolio that people understand. I can construct a short portfolio that people understand, match them together, and come up with a way to manage the risk. Interesting. Thanks. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the uh, the proxy. So, do you think that? I mean, you know, in this you know simulation, you use carbon intensity. Um, yeah. Do you think that uh, is there any? other proxies that actually measure better of the sustainability or, you know? Well, I, that's a good question. I think that's probably a pretty good generalized one, but the kinds of ideas I have for other things to look at is people worry a lot about, or I, I've, you know, talk a lot about actual physical risks and how physical climate risks impact, um, uh, uh, sustainable investing. And one of the challenges I think there are that most of the physical risks don't actually matter on the time scale of, you know, sort of stock investing. So for example, um, you know, there's some, some people who have done some interesting work on, on very specifically quantifying, well, this company has exposure to things that can flood, 
or you know this this company has too much going on in coastal Florida versus you know California wildfires and things like that. But in in many ways, all of those physical risks, at least in the near term, for the foreseeable future, are insurable, and they are insured. And so when we when we're talking about like highly, highly disruptive climate related risks in this like tipping point or or catastrophic change framework, um, what we're talking about is something happening where all of a sudden the insurance markets break down. Right. So like, um, you know, Disney World. Sure. You know, we all know Disney World could flood. Uh, you know, eventually, you know, we're going to be in a situation where, you know, we, maybe the answer is we all can agree Disney World will flood. Um, but for the foreseeable future, there really isn't much direct risk because Disney insures it all. They probably have business interruption insurance on all the flooding anyway. So as a stock investor, you're not really subject to physical risks until something goes very wrong like a discontinuous jump in that risk. And, you know, all of it. Is, so this is, you know, possibly happening in parts of California right now. It's really happening in large parts of Florida, where um, in, in Florida, it's a little bit different. But, you know, we're, we're reaching the point where if something doesn't change, then all of a sudden, there's going to be a whole lot of stuff that's not insurable. Um, and so that's what I mean by looking at different kinds of risks that are climate related, but could have different implications for an investment portfolio. That's interesting. Well, um, we are about the time, but uh, okay. I also had some questions about, you know, like why you exclude this uh, scope three and also Jeff's question about, you know, like who is implementing the principles in the market actually, but, uh, you know, uh, if you can kind of concluding or answering those, you know, like uh, two questions, sure. asking, uh, that would be great. Or, you know, anything to, you know, like, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I, I guess I don't know that, that there are, um, that there are people trying to do strategies like this. Um, there are a couple of people uh, who are still on the uh, in the in the Zoom who I will ask because they may know. Um, but uh, as far as I know, I don't know of anyone doing uh, transactions like this to mm -hmm. try to hedge climate risk. Um, you know, there's there's um, a lot more detail that goes into actual product design than you know the simple approaches I've taken. But the goal here was to, to, to help inform some thinking about, well, what can we do in public markets? Because I think one of the greatest frustrations people have is public markets aren't particularly good for or, or haven't been historically particularly successful paths for you know, uh, activist and impact investing. To a degree, that's changing. Um, and you know, hopefully for the better. Um, but I think using tools like this, at least people can start to think about, you know, what different approaches could I take? Um, yeah. So that that was very. Uh, I mean, yeah, I know that we are touching a lot of you know like very high you know like hardcore financial like uh, finance concepts today and also you know this is very new concept you know as you mentioned um mark you know it's there are not many players in the market who are actually doing this but uh i mean but you know your your talk was very clear and thank, thanks for sharing your thoughts uh, sure. today and thanks again for uh, accepting our invitation this has been <laughs> great yeah so um thank you and i'm being mindful of our, everyone's time so uh yeah stay tuned for the next um seminar um so next seminar will be on march 11th um professor uh, shelly walton from university of south carolina will be joining us uh, and she's gonna talk about improving electricity markets through improving electricity governance. So she is actually on her mini virtual visit to Stanford this quarter. So, um, and then 
SFI team is um, actively uh, looking for um, to collaborate with her um, in terms of in you know like in kind of like aligning this you know energy law and governance and market and and finance and policy. So it would be great, really great to hear about her um, research uh, next month. So um, yeah, looking forward to see you all uh, next month. And thanks, Mark. Um, now um, I will let everyone go. Thank you for coming. <laughs>